Hello everyone, welcome back. We are going to discuss pesticide management. This is chapter 13 in your textbook and I hope you guys really enjoyed your snow day yesterday with the college being closed and uh, getting to sleep in a little bit this morning opening up at 10. So this is a chapter 13 uh, pesticide management so hopefully you guys have read the chapter and now you're going to uh, take a look at the um, uh, the PowerPoint and I do want you to know that I am going to uh, give you a little bit extra time on the labs that are due for these past two chapters um, you know that was brought up in this morning's class so I'm going to give you guys uh, you know a day or two extra because it's kind of hard to do uh, the turf grass lab uh, with snow on the ground so but let's go ahead and get started with chapter 13 pesticide management so Pesticide applications, they are a very lucrative part of any uh, type of landscape business that you may be running. You can make good money um, putting out fertilize and spraying, uh, uh, spraying chemicals um, in people's turf grass and shrub beds. Tree and shrub care, lawn care, very, very good money in it. However, both um, uh, is it not only lucrative, it is a great risk because you've got to, um, I mean, you can get in some trouble uh, applying pesticides, especially when you're applying them incorrectly at the wrong rate uh, or actually spraying the wrong type or the, the wrong chemical on the turf. So it does have great risk and great liability to your business, but you can make uh, a good living at doing this. And I've told you guys this before, if I was going to work for me, myself, and I, where I didn't want to have any employees, that I just wanted to focus with me being the sole proprietor, the, the sole business employee, lawn care would be uh, the business that I would choose to do. Uh, very simple and easy to get into. As you'll see in one of my slides a little bit later, you're in business by owning three pieces of equipment. So. Pesticide regulations in 72, and if you guys have taken my pesticide class that I offer in the summer, we all know the pesticide law of 72, but along with this was FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide was amended to initiate a program that certified individuals who apply pesticides. Now, here in North Carolina, because you can see the federal government granted Primacy to the states on how to regulate the licensing. And as long as the states have a stricter licensing program and stricter laws regarding the pesticides, the EPA and the federal government is going to leave the states alone. So North Carolina does have that stricter licensing law and stricter laws that apply to applying pesticides. And in North Carolina, you must first become certified and uh, certification is, is offered through the Department of Agriculture. You can either sit through the day and a half pesticide school and then that second afternoon take your pesticide test or graduating a program like this, you guys are going to be more than qualified to sit for that exam. You just actually sit for the examination uh, when the time comes around. So you take your test, you become certified. Once you become certified, Department of Agriculture is going to send you a, a license application which you can pay for and get your pesticide license. $75 a year, uh, you've got to renew that every year and you've got to obtain um, CEU or Con Ed uh, worth 10 hours within a five year period. And we go over that more in detail uh, during the, uh, the pesticide class HOR 164 offered every summer. So. And also with this FIFRA, it identified general, pest, uh, general use pesticides, and that are going to be chemicals that you can buy at your big box stores, your homeowners. Now, we do, as professionals, apply general use pesticides, but anybody can get these general use pesticides to put on their own property. And as far as restricted use pesticides or RUPS, uh, these are pesticides that you must have a license or be certified to apply. So you've got to be the, you got to have the certification and the license to actually uh, apply these restricted use pesticides. And homeowners aren't going to be allowed uh, to buy restricted use pesticides. They're going to only be sold uh, sold uh, at chemical companies or landscape um, places that's generally not open to to the public. And if they are, they still can't buy restricted use pesticides not even to put on their own personal uh, lawns. 
Uh, also, FIFRA had some amendments in 88. Uh, they adopted the worker protection uh, standard uh, and this is mainly for agricultural employees because a lot of the uh, ag employees were being uh, exposed to different types of pesticides and you know uh, this was de developed to to actually protect them it also uh, came out with SARA uh, the Superfund amendments and reauthorization act and this is basically letting employees know they had the right to know of the chemicals that they were applying and also it came out where every applicator and, and dealer and everybody that you know dealt with pesticides have to maintain uh, material safety data sheets and i was recently told by a student this morning in class that they're no longer called material safety data sheets he was going to bring me some information on that it's they dropped a, a name out of that but for now we will stick to msds sheets uh, material safety data sheets uh, and then you need to maintain inventory, whether you're selling the product or you're actually applying the product. And what I always did when I was spraying chemicals, I'd keep a three ring binder notebook uh, in my truck. And let's say I was spreading, uh, spraying speed zone uh, in late March, early April for weed control. I would print the label off the internet or I would get it from the dealer that I purchased the pesticide, put it in my three ring binder along with my material safety data sheet. And I'd keep a log about how much uh, chemical that I was applying. Uh, speed zone wasn't restricted use, uh, but still, if I got pulled by the uh, the pesticide police, I would want to make sure that I had the information uh, necessary to give them. You always got to have that label, and you always got to have that MSDS sheet, and you need to make sure that your sprayer, especially if you're using a lot of backpacks, you know, if you've got two or three backpacks, make sure that you have the backpack labeled, uh, you know, with. Uh, broadleaf herbicide or whatever you're whatever you're putting uh, in the uh, in the uh, the backpack make sure you have all that data kept up we also kept an inventory of the chemicals we kept there at the shop uh, we'd keep one in the office and then we'd keep one uh, elsewhere just in case um, you know a fire in the office or something like that in case of a fire you're supposed to be able to hand that inventory list to the local fire department and let them know what they're dealing with if your shop with uh, your chemicals is burning again we go over that more in HOR 164 in the summer all right the pesticide label it is the written printed or graphic matter on or attached to the pesticide or any of its containers or wrappers the pesticide label constitutes a legal and binding contract between the applicator and the chemical company prohibiting the use of the pesticide in any application or procedure not consistent with the label. So, a lot of information here guys, but what I'm going to do is break it down for you. What we see right here is Zapid. This is just a generic label that's going to be printed on the bottle. Let's say this is my pesticide bottle. You know, this is my water, but the actual label would be printed onto uh, the container. Think of a Coca-Cola bottle. It's got that cellophane wrap around it with the name Coca-Cola on it. That's the label that's on the bottle. Your labeling is all other information, whether the dealer that you bought it from or an ag agent give it to you. That could be in the book form, could be in a pamphlet form. It just depends on what the chemical is. So let's take Roundup, for example. We've all seen Roundup. Uh, in, in, in the big box stores and in the, in the ag stores. And anybody can buy a Roundup. Roundup has that cellophane wrapping around the two and a half gallon jug that says Roundup. Well, that's your label. It's going to have caution, the directions for use, the EPA registration number, the active ingredients, all that's going to be on the label. But also on that two and a half gallon jug, there's a, there's a, like a slit inside of the, uh, side of the container that's got a pamphlet, a booklet, it's about that, about that big, and it's about that thick. And that's got all the labeling information um, pertaining to that pesticide. So you have the label and you have the labeling. And we can see here Roundup. Now, before we get into this label, I do want you to note that uh, your book on page 293 has a good example uh, for bug splat. And it's a 60 uh, water dispersible granular. And it's an insecticide. So please pay attention. You know, it's got 1 through um, 1 through 10D for it. So please, please pay um, uh, special attention to that. I wasn't going to scan that in and talk to you about it because the book does go over this uh, in, in, in detail. But I wanted to show you Roundup here. And 
the one thing I think people probably get most confused about is, is the names. We have the trade name. We all know Roundup to be Roundup. That is the trade name, Roundup. The common name is the glyphosate. That is the common name. And then we have the chemical name here. And forgive me if I, uh, if I mispronounce it, but I, uh, I still always get choked up on some of these uh, chemical names. But uh, phospho, uh, phosphonemethylglycine, that is the chemical name of Roundup. So we have three names that we're going by. Trade name, the common name, and the chemical name. And then you know, we can see that it is the 41% of the chemical, and then other ingredients uh, are 59%, giving us a total of 100. And these could be the inert uh, ingredients here. So I wanted to, to specify that out for you uh, with a clear, clearer label than what's in the book. But still, please pay uh, close attention to what the book is talking about with that label on page 293. All right, here we have uh, table 13.1. This is just some examples of um, formulations that we can use in pesticide. Again, HOR164 goes over this in detail, uh, but we've got some wettable powders. Uh, we have some dry flowable, and then we have some water dispersible granulars. Then we have some emulsified concentrates. We have our liquid flowables. We have dust, and we have granulars and pellets uh, that we're going to be uh, putting out. My favorite, always and foremost, is the granular. Less mess, less uh, chance of spill or accident. But you know, as a lawn care operator, put out a ton uh, of granular. Haven't done much with dust. Um, done some ECs and done uh, quite a bit of flowables. Probably flowables and granulars would be my two favorite that I'm going to be putting out. Uh, and this is just a chart, you know, pay attention to that. It's got the uh, phototoxicity, effect on application equipment. Um, you're going to experience this a lot if you do lawn care for, for a living. You're going to be replacing nozzles and tips in the nozzles, uh, you know, quite a bit throughout the, throughout the season. Uh, agitation required I meaning you're going to have to mix, uh, you know, keep the tank mixture mixing. It's going to be agitating. Um, visible residues, you know, those are um, kind of bad in certain situations, especially if you get it on somebody's sidewalk or their driveway and things like that. Uh, compatible with other formulations, you know, if it's good or fair. Um, and then whether it's, you know, um, expressed as a percent, pounds per gallon, uh, or again, percent. But again, pay attention both to the formulation itself, the label abbreviation, wettable powders, dry flowable, water dispersed granulars, uh, emulsified concentrates, flowables, and then a dust, and then granulars and, or granules and pellets. Now, the pesticide label. Again, this is going over in the book. Uh, we're going to have the product or trade name. We saw in the Roundup example that Roundup is the trade name. We've got the active ingredient. We've got the type of formulation that we just saw on table 13.1. And then we have the type of pesticide. Now, Roundup, what do you think that, what kind of uh, pesticide is that? Is it a fungicide? Is it an insecticide? Is it a herbicide or is it a PGR? Most of you are already going to know that it is a herbicide, meaning that it is going to kill uh, plant materials. Fungicides are going to uh, get rid of our fungus. Insecticides are going to take care of our insects. And then our PGRs, or plant growth regulators, are actually going to help stunt the growth of um, uh, our plant materials. Then we have the official common name. We have our chemical name that we just saw. You know, the common name for uh, Roundup was glyphosate. The chemical name is that long name that I probably misspelled or mispronounced for you. Then our inert ingredients, our surfactants, and um, surfactants are going to be like a spreader sticker that could actually help, um, actually help the chemical and and increase its effectiveness, kind of like an adjuvant, and then some wetting agents. Also, we're going to see our signal words, you know, warning, danger, caution, things like that are going to be on it. We're going to see the toxicity, uh, LD50 or LC50. Lethal dose 50 is when 50% of the population when exposed uh, dies from exposure. Uh, the lethal concentration or LC50 is when 50% uh, of the concentration uh, has an inhalation uh, exposure to it and that population dies. Uh, the LC50 is when 50% of that population dies from breathing in the, the, uh, the chemical. Uh, 
or the pesticide. Our routes of exposure, dermal, oral, inhalation. So dermal, we've got the chemical on our skin. That is the most um, dangerous way Oh, well, not the dangerous, but that is the most common way that pesticide applicators become exposed to the pesticide is they get it on their hands, uh, they get it on their arms, uh, and can be can be a very serious situation. That's how most 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 people get exposed is through dermal. But what do we do uh, when we get it on our hands? We're continuously wiping the sweat from our from our face. We're getting it close to our eyes, it gets time for break or it gets time for lunch, and then we've, we've got an oral exposure. And then again, inhalation, you're going to know, and that's probably one that you're going you're gonna to pay more close attention to because you know if, if, it, if, if you do have a greater risk of that, you're going to be wearing the mask. Um, you're not, you're not going to take that chance. But um, a lot of times uh, people will Put an application. They'll put a you know a fogger in a greenhouse or something, and then uh, not knowing that there's a pesticide application being conducted at that time, somebody would walk into the greenhouse. But the applicator is probably not going to to uh, run into that dermal, and then oral is, is a big thing for for the applicator. Get the chemical on your hand, wipe your face, or go get a cracker and a soda at break, and you've been exposed. Um, uh, through the mouth as well. And then inhalation toxicity, we've talked about the LC50 or the lethal concentration uh, 50%. Uh, pesticide adjuvants, these are substances added to a pesticide formulation or spray solution to enhance the effectiveness. They can improve the wetting ability of the spray solution. They can control evaporation of spray droplets. They can improve the pesticide persistence. They can increase foliar or insect uptake. They can adjust the pH of the spray solution. They can improve spray droplet coverage. They can increase safety of the spray to non-target plants or animals. They can correct the spray tank incom incompatibility problems. They can reduce spray drift, a big problem, uh, especially uh, in, in agricultural. You know, when you're spraying larger uh, fields, uh, there's no, no coverage or whatever, a little bit of wind comes up and you've got spray drift happening. And then mark spray pattern, dyes or, or colorants. Now I've used a lot of, uh, of tracker dyes. Um, and the bad thing about that, you're going to see how much chemical is actually getting on you. Uh, I always used to mix uh, tracker dye with my Roundup spray and weeds because I just wanted to know, know where I'd been. Doing a lot of larger commercial sites, I didn't want to double track. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, my t-shirt would be blue on the back or the straps where I had it. That much spray and just mixing and sloshing uh, would get on my back. And then I'd take my t-shirt off and I would actually look like Papa Smurf uh, looking at me from the back where I'd had the blue tracker dye gotten on me. So it helped me to realize that I needed to take better um, better care of my equipment and that I needed to uh, to make sure basically not to fill the backpack sprayer up so much. I had a lot of sloshing and where I didn't get the lid on tight I had it leaking down my back. So that happened to me several times and I had a student this morning ask me about Roundup. He got some on his leg. Is it harmful? Well it's not good for you but it's not going to kill you. I've, I've had many chemicals spilled on me and I'm still standing here today. Uh, whether or not it may affect me later on in my career who's to say but i've been exposed to to some to some bad stuff before and i'm still here uh, pesticide application equipment and i wanted to put these three up here first i didn't go in order of the book the book starts talking about our, uh, our equipment on page 299 but with these three pieces of equipment ladies and gentlemen you can be in the lawn care business a solo backpack sprayer an earthway cedar and a Lesco uh, fertilized spreader. Now, a student again this morning asked me, um, "Do you necessarily have to have these brand names?" No, I put these up here because my job is to teach you what I've had the most luck with, and these three pieces of equipment are probably my favorite in within the lawn care industry. You know, with a pickup truck, a backpack sprayer an earthway cedar and a fertilized spreader and a few bags of fertilizing chemical in the back of your truck, you are in business. 
very 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 inexpensive you know uh, 150 bucks for a good solo you know look for 100 bucks for the spreader and you know 300 or you know a little more than 300 for the spreader so a little more than 500 dollars you are in business within the lawn care industry so just wanted to put that in there again this is a backpack sprayer this is a cedar um what else does the uh, the book called it a hand operated granular applicator and then we have our centrifugal spreader here or rotary spreader here is a truck mount uh, this is actually what you call a skid mount that you can slide into the back of a pickup truck or you can mount it to uh, to a flatbed trailer uh, i own this piece of equipment here personally uh, it is a very good way to to apply um, broadleaf weed control and and when you're spraying out a lawn um, to totally eradicate it and then we've talked about spraying out the turf late July early August uh, so we could seed it uh, in, in, in September you know you could put roundup knock this out and be done with it quick but I would mix like speeds on and I would you know just spot spray the lard you know the yards you know pull the hose behind my neck spot spray it i do not like to mix my fertilize with my pesticides uh, because i'm one that's I, I hate broadcasting the whole yard if i put my liquid fertilizer in there i have to spray the entire yard that i've put my pesticides in with so if i just mix my pesticide to control my broadleaf weeds i can pull the hose off and then i can actually just spot spray and I could keep that tank mixed up. And then I'd put out my fertilized granularly with my centrifugal Lesco spreader. Uh, here are some other pesticide equipment. Uh, here we have the controlled droplet uh, applicator or the CDA. As you can see, that disc is rotating and the, 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 the liquid is hitting it and it is throwing it. Here we have like a duster, it's on top of a backpack floor. Here we have uh, a mechanical powered uh, backpack sprayer. I don't know why anybody would want to use this. I mean, I'd soon just have the hand wand because you've got to carry the extra weight of the motor and the gas. And then we have our um, um, compressed air sprayers. Here we have a hose end operator. Typically not going to be used by landscape professionals. Homeowners are going to be using the hose end. And then people like in greenhouses and stuff would probably use the smaller or using it for interior plants. Um, here we have a boom uh, sprayer uh, on the ma uh, mounted on, on a uh, tractor. Uh, the problems in the book talk about um, the calibration of this and we're going to use an example here shortly about how to calibrate one of these sprayers kind of a fun little exercise but uh, this is a good way to take care of larger turf take care of agricultural properties i don't know if i would take it in my smaller lawns that are my favorite to work in the uh, the small postage stamp lots i would use more of my backpack and my um, my backpack sprayer and rotary spreader um, here, I own this piece of equipment here too. It's a ride-on spreader. Um, you can put your fertilize in here and you can mix up your spray tank and basically what you can do is be putting out your fertilize. Uh, I would always put out my fertilize first and then double track and then kind of go back and spot spray my weeds so I'm not spraying the whole yard at the same time. I'm a big fan of putting out fertilize granularly and then spot spraying for my weeds and this machine actually helped me do it. The only problem with this machine, you have to be, you have to baby it. It's kind of like the walker mower. It, it requires a lot of maintenance. And when you use it all day and you don't come home and give it a bath and, and, and really take care of it and clean out these, um, these sprayer tips right here, you're going to have problems with this. It's, it's daily maintenance with a piece of equipment like that. Here uh, we have another type of um, hand-operated spreader, uh, the Solo. I've used it mainly to put out maybe snapshot in my shrub beds, the pre-emergent weed control, and I have put out grass seed with it, but I'd much rather use the Earthway um, hand-operated cedar to put out my grass seed. This, I, I liked putting out my snapshot. I did a lot of snapshot applications uh, in shrub beds to, uh, to pr help control uh, preventative weeds, keep those weed seeds from uh, 
terminator. Here we have a drop spreader. Not a big fan of that. Never actually ran one. Um, so can't really say much about it. If I was to use it again, it would probably be a Lesco brand that I would get. Um, I love the, uh, the the sturdiness of what they put in their products. And this is more you know built for the commercial applicator versus the homeowner. Uh, but again, you know, I don't like these because you have a chance of striping or streaking your yard. You know, it's only going to get below it, dropping below. So if you're not right on it or if you're overlapping, you could get more than needed. So it's just a lot, easy, a lot harder uh, to operate than the, uh, the centrifugal uh, uh, spreader. All right, calibration. Now, this information starts... Uh, on page 302 um, and it's fun. I love calculating sprayers. I love calibrating sprayers. I love calibrating uh, fertilized spreaders. This is, this, is, this is what we get paid to do guys. This is the science behind us having spray lights. But there's two pieces of information that we need. We need to know what our sprayer output is and we need to know what our coverage is and we're going to talk more in detail about these right now. Our sprayer output, it is measured in OPMs or fluid ounces per minute. We're going to need a stopwatch, we're going to need a container to catch the liquid, and then we're going to need an accurate measuring device. And depending on the type of sprayer, you could have uh, you know, several of these. The example that we're going to look at is a uh, five nozzle boom sprayer. Uh, we could have five of these, or we could have five five gallon buckets and then measure it in one of these. But what we're going to do is actually calibrate uh, an ATV uh, sprayer. So what we're going to do, first of all, you must use the nozzles that you're going to use in the application because there's all different types of nozzles we can put on our sprayers. So make sure that we have the correct nozzles that we're going to be using in our applications that, that we're going to calibrate for. We're going to perform the same operating parameters, meaning we're going to have the same pressure, we're going to have the same speed, and we're going to be on the same type of terrain. And hopefully that we're on site. Hopefully we're not on a hilly site when we're going to be out in the flatlands uh, fertilizing or spraying uh, yards with no heels in it. We need to measure every single nozzle that's on the sprayer. In the example that we're going to see, we have five. And what we need to do is replace any worn out or incorrect nozzles that we find after calibration. So we're going to operate the sprayer in a stationary position, usually less than one minute. Our example, we do for 10 seconds and then multiply by six. But we're going to collect the output in the containers. We're going to measure the output in the containers. And then we're going to repeat two more times and we're going to get the average, which is going to be our ounces per minute. Now, I also had a student tell me in this morning's class that the example in this book was much harder than the one that we went over in pesticide management last summer. And it is. This is kind of a, uh, this is kind of a difficult problem. But the good news is I'm not going to be testing you uh, on calibration. I'm just going to test you on definitions and things like that. There's not going to be any math uh, with, with calibration on your unit to exam. So good news there. But here's our example. We have a five nozzle boom sprayer and we're going to collect each nozzle for 10 seconds. And here it's on an ATV. This is a good way to put out, put out chemicals, guys. Um, you can do it in, in the lawns. There's nothing wrong with having an ATV to do that. And the good thing about an ATV, you know, they're good around the shop, moving equipment, hooking up a little trailer too. So very useful in the landscape business is, is an ATV. So we've got our five, uh, five nozzle, one, two, three, four, and five over there. We've got five nozzles. I want you to know that table 13.4 in your book is incorrect. On the next slide, I've retyped this chart to make it uh, better for you. So print out these slides and kind of stick this in your book. And the book says to multiply by five, we need to multiply by six to give us the 60 seconds. So here's the chart that I typed up, table 13.4. We've got the five nozzles that's on our ATV sprayer. We did ounces per 10 seconds, so nozzle one. Whoops, sorry about that. Nozzle one collected uh, 13, 11, and 12. We, we, we collected it for three different times, so 13, 11, then 12. Nozzle two uh, did 13, 11, and 12. 
13, did 12, 12, 13. Nozzle 4 did 11, 12, 13. Then nozzle 5 did 13, 12, 12. So what we did, I multiplied it by 6. Book says to multiply by 5, but remember we're doing it for a minute, ounces per minute. So I did the average 13 times 6 is 78, 11 times 6 is 66, and so forth. And then I took the average of the three. So the average 78, 66, and 72 is 72. So the average ounces per minute for nozzle 1 is 72. It's 72 for nozzle 2, it's 74 for nozzle 3, and it is 74, I mean 72 for nozzle 4, and then 74 for nozzle 5, which gives us a total output of 364 ounces per minute that our ATV sprayer, sprayer is going to put out. So we run that sprayer for a minute, we're going to put out 364 ounces per minute. As you can see in the book, page 303, uh, for nozzle 1 and nozzle 2, he had 22 um, both times. He had 22 here and he had 22 here. They needed to be 11 to make the math work. I'm sure it was just a typo. So to convert our ounces per minute uh, to gallons per minute, sorry about that, should be uh, GPM, we're going to divide by 128. And why do we divide by 128? Because there's 128 ounces in a gallon. So gallons per minute, uh, we're going to divide our OPM by 128. And since we had 364 ounces per minute, so we divided 364 by the 128 gives us 2.84 gallons per minute. 2.84 gallons per minute is what that sprayer is putting out. Okay, now we need to talk a little bit about coverage before we get into calibrate. We need to figure out what coverage is, and coverage is the amount of time that it takes to spray a given area, and it is always expressed in minutes per acre. Landscape professionals would much rather hear minutes per thousand square feet. I like, I like, I like the thousand square foot uh, increments. If, you, if you've taken my pesticide class, uh, you know that I divide everything into 1,000 square blocks. And we're going to represent this by minutes per thousand square feet. And the reason we're using M is because M is the Roman numeral for a thousand. So M over N. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to mark a hundred foot straight line. We're going to start at point A and we're going to move 100 feet to point B so we have a 100 foot line and we're going to run that sprayer from point A to point B three different times. So we've got runs one, two, and three and the seconds to travel that 100 feet. So run one, it took 89 seconds. Run two, it took 90 seconds. Run three, it took 91 seconds for a total of 270, but we're taking the average and we divided it by three, so we're going to get 270 divided by three, gives us 90 seconds average for that 100 feet. So from point A to point B, it's taking my sprayer 90 seconds or a minute and a half to do 100 feet. Well, next step is to calculate the effective spray width. And this five nozzle boom sprayer has a width of 10 feet. So 10 feet, you know, I mean, it's a little bit longer, uh, longer than this, but it's 10 feet. And we know that it takes a minute and a half or 1.5 minutes or 90 seconds to cover from point A to point B. So to determine coverage, multiply the linear feet, which is 100, traveled by the effective spray width. So we have 100 times 10, in a minute and a half. So our minutes per thousand square feet is 1.5. So to do a thousand square feet because our spray width is 10 feet by 100 from point A to point B, we have one point, uh, it takes 1.5 minutes or 90 seconds uh, to cover a thousand square feet. Now, to determine minutes per acre, we're simply going to multiply our minutes per thousand by 43.56, which is a constant. And as we can see here, it worked out 1.5 times 43.56 is going to give me 65.34 minutes per acre. Now, the output 
is in ounces per minute or gallons per minute and the coverage is in minutes per thousand or minutes per acre. They're multiplied to obtain the amount of water applied per unit area. For example, ounces per thousand square feet is equivalent to our 364 that we calculated, ounces per minute, times the 1.5 minutes per thousand gives us 546. Our gallons per acre is 2.84 gallons per minute, which we calculated, times the 65.34 minutes per acre, which gives us 185.56 gallons per acre. So our sprayer will deliver either 546 ounces per minute or 185.56 gallons per acre. Good, good math problem there. Please go over it a couple of times, you know, kind of understand what we're going. If you haven't taken pest management, this will help out in the pest management class this summer. And you guys should really understand this if you've taken pest management. But I know we didn't look at a problem like this uh, during the summer, but this is a good, good example of calibrating a, uh, an ATV uh, sprayer. Or it could be any type of sprayer. It could be a five boom sprayer on a little lawn tractor. All right, calibration of granular application, uh, granular application equipment. Uh, I don't have internet plugged up to this laptop right now. So this, this link here on how to cal uh, calibrate uh, a push spreader is in a YouTube uh, under the links uh, on this week's uh, work. So you will see that under the links. So I'm not going to show that here um, uh, with this slide. The line offset method. Now, this is good if you have an op-shaped lawn or if you have a putting green um, that you need to calculate the square feet. What we're basically going to do is we're going to start and we're going to split the area in half. We're going to call it A and we're going to call it B. And then in three foot increments, every three feet, we're going to draw a vertical line. And then what we're going to do is measure these lines. A and B, we both have zero. Then C is 10, D is 12, E is 11, F is 10, G is 9, H is 7, I is 10, J is 12, K is 12, and the sum of the offsets is 93. And then we're going to take the sum of offsets, which is 93, multiply the three feet increments in between them, and it's going to give us a square feet of 279. So that's how you calculate an ob-shaped yard or a putting green or tee box that's that's you know kind of off like that. And that's how you can calculate that square foot. And before we close it, please pay attention um, to the geometric shapes that are on page 308. We should all know the area of a box. We should all know the area to, uh, to calculate a trapezoid, triangle, uh, area of a circle, and the area of an elliptical shape because these could all be um, shapes that we run into our lawn care profession. And please, please stop being jealous of the grass on my side of the fence. Get out and get some fertilizer and make yours greener. A little humor to end this chapter. Guys, I will have your lab up shortly. I'm also going to put up a um, short tech tube video for your lab this week on how to use Forsyth County Geodata. It'll be a short, quick um, video. It's just me running through a rental property that we have uh, that you can pull pictures and actually pull square footage of the lawn. So um, that being said, have a great weekend. Maybe uh, we'll get a little more snow and uh, let's watch that Duke Carolina game tonight. Thanks and have a good one.